This presentation about bullying has been put together by psychologists and social workers to be used as a tool to help educate parents and staff about the topic of bullying. Bullying happens every day, and it happens across all settings, not just in schools. Most of us have experienced bullying in some capacity, whether we were the victim, bystander, or the bully. I am Bridget Beckman Winter, a licensed clinical social worker and school social worker at the schools I currently work in are CA Henning and Marine Elementary. When talking about bullying, it is important to understand the bully triangle and how there are three different individuals involved in every bully situation. We teach students about the bully, the victim, and the bystander. The more common term we are trying to teach students about today, though, is an upstander rather than a bystander. We want students to know that it is okay to speak up and intervene in a bullying situation. It is important to know that bullying behavior stop 57% of the time within 10 seconds of an upstander speaking up for a victim. This is crucial when we think about how a small gesture can have such a powerful effect on others, the bully and the victim. Despite knowing that speaking up for others can be such an integral part of stopping a situation, it doesn't occur enough because it is hard to insert yourself into a situation and risk being a victim yourself. This is something we are asking students to do, but even as an adult, it is a difficult situation to be in and to tell someone to stop, don't do that, or that isn't the right thing to do. When talking to students about bullying, we let them know that the bystander and upstander is the most important component of this triangle. The other two parts of the triangle, the bully is the person we speak about as the individual who is engaging in the hurtful, purposeful behavior, and the victim is the target of that negative behavior. There are many definitions of bullying, but all have similar elements which determine if the negative actions of someone is bullying behavior or something else. Bullying happens when individuals try to create an imbalance of power. That is the goal of the interaction. It is repeated, doing it over and over and seeking out a specific individual. This constitutes bullying. In order for a behavior to be considered bullying behavior, it must be repetitive where incidents happen to the same person by the same individual or group of people more than once. Most bullying occurs because we are different from one another. Kids get teased because they are built differently, or they get left out of a group of individuals because someone in that group doesn't like the way they dress or is jealous of that person's looks, abilities, or possessions. The truth is that we are all different, but we are also very similar. If we take the time to get to know each other, we will see that our differences make us unique and interesting. As long as there are differences in the way we look, dress, act, or think, some people will respond to those differences in a negative way. When we talk about bullying, it is important to also discuss the terms of conflict, rudeness, and someone being mean. The term bullying gets used a lot when an altercation occurs between students, but we need to take a step back and look at the true definition and the definitions of a conflict, rudeness, or mean behavior. In a conflict, all parties get upset by the disagreement. Conflicts are occasional. Individuals want the problem to be worked out, and all parties take and accept responsibility for their actions. When we examine the term rude, we see that it is spontaneous and unintentional. It can cause upset feelings, but it is still occasional. Typically, the rude person does accept some responsibility for their actions because their negative behavior was based out of thoughtlessness or a deficit in their social skills. Meanness, however, does occur as an intentional act, but it only happens once or twice before the person moves on. When someone is mean, it is based out of anger. Mean behavior needs to be addressed, which then oftentimes has the offender regretful about how they acted. There are four types of bullying behavior. They are verbal, physical, cyber, and depending on what literature you are looking at, the last one is social, emotional, or relational. We will describe these more in depth in the next few slides. Verbal bullying is using words to hurt people. It can be saying or writing hurtful things about someone. It can be teasing, name calling, or an inappropriate, unwanted, repeated verbal interaction. Sometimes individuals may tease their peers and not realize their friends don't like it or find it a joke. We encourage students, if they are being teased or called names, to tell the person they don't like it because many times their peers think they are joking or being funny. Once an individual has spoken up or someone has spoken up for them, if the verbal taunting continues, it is considered bullying behavior. Physical bullying is using actions to hurt people. 
This is often the epitome of what individuals think of when someone talks about bullying. It can be directed specifically at someone's body, but it can also include taking individuals' possessions. Hitting, kicking, pushing, or breaking someone's possessions are a few examples of physical bullying. We encourage students, if they see physical bullying occurring, to stand up for the victim by trying to get them out of the situation or to go and get an adult. Sometimes students can even distract the bully by asking them an unrelated question, which can stop the physical bullying from continuing and can allow time for an adult to be notified or the victim to leave. Social emotional relational bullying is using your relationship to hurt someone. This is when an individual uses their social power to influence peers or potentially bystanders and upstanders to help victimize someone. This relational bullying is often the most difficult to see occurring because it includes excluding peers, spreading rumors, or embarrassing individuals, but there isn't always a direct interaction between the victim and bully. Another aspect of relational bullying is the bully trying to get someone to do things for them by saying, you can't be my friend if you don't do what I ask, or we won't invite you to a party. We encourage students, if they recognize relational bullying happening, to be the upstander and a friend to a victim or individual who is getting excluded. Cyberbullying is when individuals use technology to intentionally hurt someone. It can be done in any setting and with any device. Cyberbullying can be done through social media, texting, video gaming systems, and of course through phone calls. We encourage students to physically know who their friends are on social media sites, to block unwanted calls or texts from individuals engaging in the bullying behavior, and of course, bring the evidence, whether it is a screenshot of a text or statement on social media to an adult or administration. Addressing bullying in our district is a continual work in progress. Although there is not a formal curriculum utilized at individual buildings, or at the district level, bullying prevention is emphasized with students throughout the concept of respect. At the elementary level, we attempt to instill the concept of kindness to all individuals and that there is a difference between being friends with someone and being friendly to someone. We try to focus on positive interactions between individuals and we incorporate that through our curriculum. Many teachers reported that within their classroom environment, whether it be language arts, science, social studies, physical education, or health, they focus on helping students to understand how to give constructive feedback and engage in positive dialogues, as well as honor one another's ideas. Teachers concentrate on having students respect other ideas through working in small groups, completing investigations for activities, and to have collaboration with peers. We encourage students to establish positive peer relationships so students know how to diffuse conflicts in and out of the classroom. Teachers have students doing projects such as the Wax Museum, Famous American Project, and things related to Black History Month. Students are taught through classroom lessons with a social worker or an outside agency brought in about safe and unsafe touches, as well as the concepts of bullying that we discussed earlier in the presentation. Through our computer science classes, students are able to use Digital Passport, which is a game-based program about common sense media. It explores topics of digital citizenship, such as privacy, multitasking, creative commons, and copyright, as well as cyberbullying. In the cyberbullying lessons, students learn what cyberbullying is, who is involved, and they play a game where they read situations and choose what an upstander would do. Students also participate in Google's recently released digital citizenship program called Being Internet Awesome. They tackle concepts like phishing, internet safety, and being kind online. In the lesson, Being Internet Kind, students learned about giving constructive feedback online when commenting, identifying cyberbullying, and reacting appropriately and recognizing that online communication lacks many of the social clues that face-to-face -face communication has. Students discuss ways to use tools like emojis and punctuation, as well as making their messages clear and detailed to help avoid unnecessary confusion in online interactions. All the elementary schools have things building wide that change each year, which promotes kindness and respect. At the middle school, besides throughout the curriculum, we have student council that focuses on having students build the morale of the school with each other and help school be a positive environment. There is the Brighter Futures Club, an interpersonal relationship class, which specifically targets students who may struggle with social relationships. 
There's also group and individual counseling options to help students improve their social skills, self-esteem, coping skills, and just promote their ability to function independently and positively at school. Middle school teachers reported that they work to establish an environment of respect by starting the year off with expectations. They facilitate topics of discussion as they write in English or in read literature. In class, students discuss different opinions and viewpoints in character analysis. Turn in talks, partner work, and group work are completed to help students be successful with others. In addition to the curriculum, at the high school, there is a Brighter Futures Club. It came out of the Manny Jackson Center for Humanity, where all schools will identify things in their building to improve respect, dignity, forgiveness, and understanding. The club focuses on recognizing students more frequently for the good things they are doing. Also, the club does activities for students to decompress during the school day. For example, lunch outside, a trunk or treat, but most specifically, there's a different activity planned each month. Another club at the high school is the Alpha Club. The premise of this club is anti-alcohol and drug. The activities can focus on why students self-medicate and the importance of self-respect and being respectful and kind to others. Teachers explain that throughout the curriculum, they emphasize etiquette when it comes to critiquing others' work and needing evidence to back up statements they make. Students are coached to use appropriate communication. Stereotypes are discussed in class and how they damage all involved. Overall, when staff is aware of a situation where disrespectful actions or words have been used, they attempt to address it and stop it. Doing the right thing is discussed and talking about the idea of morality and the struggle to make moral decisions and not just popular ones is reinforced throughout the student body. The last way as a district we address bullying is in the month of October. October is Bullying Prevention Month, but also Red Ribbon Week. Throughout this week and the month, we focus on healthy living and relationships and how healthy choices are not just about being drug and alcohol free, but also being respectful to all. My name is Kirsten Wilkerson, and I am a school psychologist at St. Jacob Elementary School and Henning Elementary School, and we are going to talk about some of the myths surrounding bullying. So um, to begin with, one of the most common myths is that you are able to tell who a bully is just by looking at them, which is rarely the case. Children who bully typically do not fit the stereotype that you see typically in movies or TV shows of a child who is more muscle-bound or hot-tempered, um, maybe the mean kid from across town. Sometimes children who are the smaller ones, the smaller in stature, become bullies to compensate for their size. Many children who are identified as bullies may be those socially connected popular kids that are from what you would consider a good family. And some of those skills that they have, those higher level social skills, are what makes their bullying behavior easier to get away with, prevents adults from seeing them as being a bully towards other children. The next myth is that you can always tell a bully from a victim, and we know just working in the schools that that is not always the case. A child who one day may be the victim, um, the next day may be the one that is engaging in bullying behavior. And so, especially in those younger grades, you can see children that are excluded one day, um, maybe name calling the next, and that blurring of roles between victim and bully behavior makes it very difficult or makes it a challenge to figure out exactly who started the problem or where it began. So the third myth that we're going to discuss is that teachers and other um, adults within the school setting should be able to see bullying easily. Bullies plan their behaviors to avoid being caught. Um, many bullies engage in behaviors that are not typically spots where there are a lot of adults or where behavior is being monitored more frequently, such as locker rooms, um, restrooms, the cafeteria, outside at recess, and um, also in the hallways passing between class periods. Many kids who bully also know how to manipulate the adults in their environment, including parents and teachers. And for all of those reasons, it makes it very difficult to be aware of everything that's happening and, and keep an eye on those kids who may be engaging in those bullying behaviors within the school setting. So the next myth is that kids who are bullied often ask for it. 
Typically, children who are the victims of bullying are the kids that we think of as sometimes different. They may have a disability. Uh, they may be kids who have more um, extreme emotional reactions, and so they have tempers and get upset easily. They may be the kids who are socially awkward, and they don't really understand social rules for their age group. And typically, this may make them more annoying to be around, and it makes them targets as kids who are the ones that are going to be bullied in the school setting. And you also see at times that they may also engage in bullying behavior themselves. The next myth is that children bully because they have poor control of their anger. Children who bully other children do so a lot of times in order to gain or maintain social power in their peer group. Um, they target other children they perceive as weak or different. Um, we talked about, you know, they may be the kids that are socially awkward, the ones that don't necessarily understand uh, the social rules in the school setting, um, and they target kids who are not able to defend themselves. They use those social situations to bully, um, and when bystanders don't step up and don't do anything when they're silent or when they laugh, when they witness those type of behaviors, that just becomes um, socially reinforcing for the person to continue those behaviors and to um, engage in bullying others. Uh, Cyberbullying is less damaging than traditional verbal or physical bullying. This is the next myth, and we're going to talk a little bit later about cyberbullying and different apps that are commonly used and where those behaviors are seen. Uh, I think, you know, in, in this day and age, uh, electronics have become so popular. Kids, you know, are on tons of social media sites, and it makes it hard to um, monitor their behaviors when they're using social media and and they don't shut off so when we think about you know the typical bullying during the school day you know you leave you go home those behaviors end at the end of the school day and maybe start back up the next day when you're talking about social media when you're talking about cyber bullying um, even if you are not online if you don't have a presence online the damage continues um, even after you turn off your own personal device. Um, typically, the internet bullying behavior is most often anonymous, so you don't know who it is that is um, directing those behaviors towards you. Um, and you can see the bullying behavior become bolder due to the physical distance and not seeing their reaction, the reaction of the victim. Kids who bully are often unsupervised in their online activities. Um, and like we said before, it can happen 24 hours a day, all week long, rather than just during the school hours. And there really isn't a safe place uh, to be without threat of being bullied when you're using cyberbullying and social media. So now we're going to talk about who is at risk for being targeted by bullies. Generally, children who are bullied uh, have one or more of the following risk factors. They may be perceived as different from their peers, such as being overweight or underweight, wearing glasses or different types of clothing, kids who are new to a school, or children who are unable to afford what kid, kids consider as cool. Um, they may be perceived as weak or unable to defend themselves um, and not have necessarily a peer group who would be there to defend them as a bystander. Children who are bullied may be depressed, anxious, or have low self-esteem. They may be kids who are less popular than others and have fewer friends. And they may be the kids that don't get along well with others and sometimes are seen as annoying, provoking, antagonizing others for attention. What are the warning signs that a child is being bullied? So some of the things to look for, changes in your child, signs that may point to a problem uh, that they are being bullied. First one, unexplained injuries. So if they come home, they look like they've been in a fight, maybe, you know, unexplained bruises. Um, the next one, lost or destroyed clothing, um, books, electronics, jewelry, sometimes in, in the time period between school and traveling home, those items um, may disappear. Frequent headaches or stomach aches, feeling sick, faking illness. So kids that have been bullied, you may see these behaviors when they're trying to avoid 
um, going to school, being in situations where uh, they're in the same physical space, proximity with those kids that are bullying them, and oftentimes uh, faking not feeling well is a good way to get out of those situations. Uh, The last one, changes in eating habits. So skipping meals or binge eating. There are times where kids may come home hungry from school because they didn't eat lunch. They wanted to avoid those social situations where they would be in the cafeteria at the same time with their bully. Uh, Some more uh, different signs to be on the lookout for. Uh, Maybe difficulty with sleeping or having frequent nightmares, waking up multiple times in the night, Um, school, uh, grades, loss of interest in school, not wanting to go to school, trying to avoid um, being present uh, during the school day, sudden loss of friends or avoidance of social situations, not wanting to go places that maybe in the past they have wanted to frequent. Uh, feelings of helplessness or decreased self-esteem in your children. And the last one, self-destructive behaviors such as running away from home, harming themselves, um, or talking about hurting themselves or uh, suicide. And, you know, it's important to be aware that while these may be signs that you would see in a child who has been bullied, not all children who have been subject to bullying are going to exhibit the warning signs that we just talked about. So one of the commonly asked questions is why don't kids ask for help if, you know, if they are suffering from being the target of a bully, why don't they seek out help from adults or other safe people in the environment at school or even outside of school? There's a lot of different reasons that kids don't ask adults for help. Uh, One may be that bullying can make kids feel helpless. They may want to try to handle it on their own, you know, feel in control again of what's going on around them. They may fear that others would see them as being weak or a tattletale. Uh, They may fear backlash from the kid who bullied them. You know, they're afraid that if they tell that it's going to make the situation worse. And it can just generally be a humiliating experience. Kids may not want adults to know um, what's being said about them, whether what is being said is true or false. They don't want others to know that negative things are being said. They may also fear that adults will judge them or punish them for being weak. Um, Kids who are bullied, they may already feel socially isolated and the You know, they may feel that no one cares or would understand what they're going through, and so they don't want to share those feelings, worrying about being isolated even more. And they also, you know, they fear being rejected by their friends and their peer group. Um, Friends can help protect kids from bullying, and, you know, they may fear that by telling uh, about what's happening to them that they're going to lose their social support. So what types of children are more likely to bully other children? Some of the children that engage in bullying behavior are well connected to their peers. They have that social power. Um, They're overly concerned about their popularity and they like to dominate or be in charge of others. Some kids who bully are more isolated from their peers. They may be depressed or anxious, have low self-esteem, be less involved in school, um, easily pressured by peers, so they're more of a follower than a leader, and they may not identify with emotions or feelings of others. They don't have empathy to understand how their behavior impacts others. Children who have these factors also tend to be more aggressive or easily frustrated. There may be less parental involvement um, at home. There may be issues at home. They have difficulty following rules, and they typically view violence in a positive way, and they may have friends who bully others, and so they see that as an acceptable behavior because of um, their friends that they are um, involved with in their peer group tend to engage in the same behaviors. So what are some signs that a child is engaging in bullying behavior towards others? One would be that they get into physical or verbal fights with others. Um, We spoke about, you know, they may have that peer group that uh, has friends who bully other kids, and so they see that as an acceptable behavior. Um, Children who bully may become increasingly aggressive towards others. 
um, get sent to the principal's office frequently. They may have unexplained uh, belongings, extra money, uh, new toys, things that they're bringing home from school. They may blame others for their problems. Uh, at times, they don't accept responsibility for their actions. They, you know, may say, it's not my fault, it's somebody else, I, you know, it's not me who did that. And they may be children who are competitive and worry about their reputation or popularity, and they see their behavior as a way to um, gain popularity and to increase their reputation. This is Trisha Ockamp, school psychologist at Silver Creek and Marine Elementary, And now let's discuss some tips for parents. We know that parents along with schools can be the best allies in bullying prevention. So what are some things you can do as parents to help be proactive? First and foremost, talk and listen to your child every day. Make it a point to hear how their day went. Um, You can do this at dinner time or when they're settling in at home or anytime you feel like you have their attention. Dinner time is when we do this in my family and ask questions like, who did you play with today? What good things happened today? Did anything make you sad today, etc.? Staying involved in their lives and helping them feel comfortable talking to you is key. You will also be able to notice changes in them more quickly um, when you are involved. Second, be a good example. Our kids are watching how we act all the time, so the ways in which we act shape how they react to things too. So being mindful of how we react to people is important. Going along with that is teaching our kids to treat others with respect and kindness. Talking to them about differences among people and that it is okay and not wrong for someone to be different than they are. Making attempts to expose your kids to other groups of people is helpful. The fourth tip is to create healthy anti-bullying habits. So this is kind of walking your kids through different situations, almost like role playing with them, so they know how to react when situations come up. Coaching our children through problems and showing them what to do and what not to do will help them in those real-life situations when they encounter those. Lastly, make sure they understand what bullying is and that it is not tolerable for them to bully or watch others be bullied. So what to do if bullying occurs? First, you'll always want to avoid any assumptions and just be there to listen without judgment. Try to avoid questions like, did you say something to upset these kids? Or did you do something to them first, making them feel like they caused it somehow? Second, please always include the teacher with any concerns. There is a huge chance that the teacher may not be aware that there is a problem going on because a lot of bullying issues occur when the teacher is not around. What the teacher will notice, though, are changes in your child's behavior, so definitely let them know your concerns. Also, problem solve with your child. The term bullying is used to describe a wide range of behaviors that makes it nearly impossible to find one solution to help all kids. When you brainstorm solutions with your child, you empower your child to take control. We recommend that you do not tell your child to physically fight back, and the reason we say that is because then they could get hurt, they could get expelled or suspended. If there are threats to their safety, you should have the school administration intervene. If there is an immediate threat to your child outside of school hours, you should contact the police. A good solution that I think is key is to identify a touchstone in your child's life. Um, A touchstone would be someone usually at school that is a trusted person to your child, and they could go to them when they need help. This could be a teacher, a principal, a social worker, a psychologist, a nurse, etc. Lastly, one thing we also recommend not to do is to schedule a meeting with or approach the other child. Most of the time this will just be awkward for your child and really does nothing to solve the problem. If there is a true imbalance of power, your child may feel scared to face their bully, and if forced to do this, it could break the trust between you and your child, which is never what you want in this situation. So what to do if your child is a bully? First, take bullying seriously. Make sure your child understands that you will not tolerate bullying at home or anywhere else and provide immediate consequences for their actions. Try to learn about their social life and how they react to stress. So many cases, kids bully because they have trouble managing strong emotions like anger, frustration, or insecurity. In other cases, kids haven't learned cooperative ways to work out conflicts and understand differences. Encourage good behavior. I can't say this enough. Catch your kids being good. Sometimes positive reinforcement can be more powerful than negative discipline. When they handle situations in ways that are constructive or positive, take notice and praise them for it. Start looking at your home. So start thinking about what's happening in your house. When conflicts arise in your own life, be open about the frustrations you have and how you cope with your feelings in a more constructive way. Lastly, and probably most importantly, get help. Reach out to teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, and psychologists who can help you. Your doctor would be a good resource for support as well. 
If your child has a history of arguing, defiance, and trouble controlling anger, consider an evaluation with a therapist or a behavioral health professional. Hi, this is Kelly Thomason. I'm the school psychologist at Triad High School. I'll be discussing the topic of cyberbullying. This is an aspect of our kids' life that as adults we have never lived through. As adults, we've learned coping and problem-solving skills to know how to deal with conflict. However, our kids are still learning and sometimes they don't know how to handle these issues. Many times, people are willing to be a bit braver behind a screen than they would be in person. As a result, we need to be proactive and prepare our children for these issues. Research suggests that 82% of kids are exposed to inappropriate material online before the age of 11, which is pretty concerning. There are some resources available to help guide conversations with your kids and establish online rules and expectations at home. Topics of discussion might include not sharing personal information such as your birth date, address, or phone number, or sharing passwords with others, but even to more significant issues such as meeting online friends or sharing pictures without parent permission. While many sites have age guidelines, it's relatively easy for someone to put in false information and gain access. NetSmartsKids.org is an online resource utilized by Boy Scouts of America as a requirement to learn more about internet and cyber safety. Parents can use this as a tool for younger students. However, these basic rules can be used to develop contracts with your child and tie them to technology privileges and consequences at home. When talking with children about how to deal with cyberbullying, there are some strategies to use to remove the power from the bully. The first is to encourage your child not to react to those bullying situations. This is what that person is seeking. Other people chime in and the situation quickly escalates when the bully is getting attention. Ultimately, it's best to not respond and ignore the messages or posts. The other suggestion that we typically give when processing situations in the district is to block the bully. Settings on cell phones and social media sites allow students to easily remove the bully from being able to make contact. However, for whatever reason, this seems to be difficult for students. By cutting off contact, perhaps they feel the person will continue to say things and they won't know what is being said. However, what we know is that when the person is no longer getting attention for their behavior, it will stop. There are features on most social media sites which allow the person to report incidents of harassment or cyberbullying, which can be utilized to stop the issue. The other suggestion that we give is that students maintain hard evidence of issues which have occurred online or via text. Take a screenshot or print out the content to share with administrators. When processing situations in the office, it's much easier to discern what has been said or done when administration can see it. Many times, kids want to show this information as proof of their role, which provides support to discipline the other party. Part of managing these issues is monitoring our kids' devices. The struggle with this for parents is you have to learn when to pick your battles and only intervene when absolutely necessary. As parents, we have a need to fix problems for our kids, but if they are aware that all their online activity is being monitored, there's a greater likelihood that they will become sneaky and find ways to hide information. There are a number of technology options which can be utilized. For instance, if you have an Apple device, you can utilize iCloud features and share your devices on the cloud. This allows you to read text messages and look at information on their apps. If you have another type of device, it would be worthwhile to ask how these features work. A website that can be utilized is NetNanny. This allows you to block sites that have content such as dating, nudity, pornography, or tobacco. You can also set the features to provide a warning if specific words such as suicide are used. Within the district, we have a feature similar to this called Gaggle. This is a Google feature used to monitor concerning content. There is an administrator in each building who receives flagged information typed in by students on their Chromebooks. Content is reviewed by administration, and if warranted, information is shared with counseling staff so we can talk further with students and find out what was going on. Another site parents can use is called Secure Teen, which provides call logs and allows you to read your child's text messages. The last is Teen Safe, which is the most advanced of the sites featured and allows parents to track text messages and calls, but also provides a GPS location for your child. We wanted to discuss some dangerous apps for 
parents to be aware of. That being said, this information is constantly changing, so my suggestion would be for you to intermittently Google apps to be aware of. In looking at this slide, you may notice it's a little surprising that some of the apps making the most dangerous list are among those even used by parents, which include Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Instagram becomes an issue with people posting comments under pictures, which is an avenue where there could be issues with cyberbullying. Also, some children will develop Finstagrams, where they have multiple accounts, one that their parents follow and another with the real content they share with their friends. Twitter has similar issues and does little to block pornography or bullying, and little is done to take down information. Snapchat is an app where students become overly confident as the features allow for information to be sent and then it disappears. However, the app now allows users to take screenshots of the content and then it can be captured. This becomes an avenue for issues with sexting and sharing of nude photos. This is definitely an app that frequently causes issues within the office. This app also has a GPS locator and friends on the app can see the location of one another unless this feature is turned off. Musical.ly is an app that is popular with young children. The app allows a video of the user to be paired with a popular song and creates a karaoke-like lip sync experience which makes it look like the child's actually singing the song. The concern is that similar to other sites, individuals create user profiles that may not be accurate and this could be a path for predators to access children. Omegly is a free online chatting site that pairs strangers via webcam to interact with one another. There are no registration requirements, so there is no way to track users if they engage in inappropriate behaviors. House Party is a group video chat app that's essentially similar to FaceTime, although allows multiple users. Mutual friends of anyone in the group is able to join the conversations, which leads to children talking to other people they don't know. After School is an app that is advertised as an online message board for your school where you can share quotes or events. It is more likely used to share embarrassing or personal information about other people. At the time of this presentation, 85% of high schools in the United States are featured on the app. 492 Triad High School students are connected as well. Information can be posted anonymously, although the app was updated to allow individuals to post under their real name. This opens up opportunities for students to share negative information or rumors about other students or teachers. Ask FM is an app that offers an opportunity for individuals to ask personal questions of another anonymously. Wishbone is a pop culture app used to get information about popular celebrities. However, there is a private messaging feature which individuals can use to communicate with each other. Therefore, this provides an opportunity for students to hide information from their parents. Down is an app that identifies people nearby that may be interested in casual sex or dating. Hot or Not indicates that you have to be 13 or older to use the app and you cannot share photos with anyone over the age of 17, but there are no age verification processes. The app allows boys and men to rate if a female is hot or not. These are just some examples of apps to be aware of. As I mentioned previously, they are always changing as new apps are being created. Monitor the activity on your children's devices and encourage them to talk about activity online that concerns them. Hello, my name is Dr. Winslow. I am the principal at Triad High School. Bullying is a big issue and it's something that we really take seriously as administrators in the Triad District. We want every student to come to school with the, the freedom to focus on their education, to focus on doing what's most important and that is uh, to do the, the best that they can in the building. And bullying just takes them out of that mindset. Uh, you, if you have a student who is demeaning or making fun of, uh, and, and just and just bringing down a student, it's really hard to concentrate on their studies. It's really hard to to do what's right in the in the school building, and it just and so this is something that we we take very seriously, and we we go about it uh, in in various steps. The first thing that we do is obviously whenever a phone call or an email comes, we want to talk to the 
the parent. So it's very important that the parent uh, make that time to to discuss the the severity of the issue with the administrator, so that we can get the whole picture from the parent's viewpoint. This is going to allow us to determine the players who are involved. It could be other students. Uh, if it's cyberbullying, we we love to be able to see screenshots of of the cyberbullying issue. So it's always important to to save a image on a phone and or a computer. If it's uh, staff members, if it's if it has involvement with with people in the district, we want to know all those players that are involved. And then we look very closely at the district's board policy. The the board has a policy that describes prevention of and response to bullying, intimidation, and harassment. And one of the key factors to this board policy is that the bullying has to be severe and pervasive. And again, when we talk about severe, it's got to be so bad that it's causing the kid not to be able to concentrate on their studies. And it has to be pervasive in that it's not just one point in time. It's something that happens over and over and over again. It could be over a couple of weeks. It could be over a couple of months. Obviously, we want to know it about it as soon as possible. But if we if it's considered bullying, it's got to be pervasive. And we try to, we, we try to, to determine that. And so that is what we refer to in the district's board policy. Whenever we do get a call and we, we start investigating the situation, we call in various students cited in the complaint, and we always provide the student due process. Again, due process gives us the ability to hear the side from the student, not only from the student who is being bullied, but also the student who is bullying. And so we call in, we may call in third party witnesses. Uh, that again is very important to sort of see their point of view. We also have videos in all of our hallways in our buildings. We can pull those up as well as videos on the buses. And so that's something that we pull up as well. So it's important that uh, parents and, and people know that this doesn't happen right away. It, it may take a number of days to, to go through the investigation. Once we do determine that bullying has indeed taken place, we really try to make it very clear to the student who is bullying that the bullying has to stop. The bullying is not something that we want in our school buildings. We want our school buildings to be a positive place. We want our culture to be maintained the way that, that we have built it. So obviously, if a student who has done the bullying, we are going to integrate some type of discipline. Now, the discipline that we have could be as simple as a verbal warning all the way up until suspension. But we want to be able to, uh, again, show students that the bullying is, is something that we do not want. And so many times this involves as well restorative practices. And a lot of that restorative practices deals with educating the student about proper social behavior, about helping them understand how the, the nature of their bullying really demeans others uh, and, and really brings them down. So we, we go through these restorative practices through a lot of self-reflection. It could be journal writing. It could be talking to a social worker. It could be talking to a counselor. And again, that's not just a one point time many time, many times in this in these practices we we call the bully in multiple times to again uh, talk with them and 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 help them understand that there's a better way to to go through this one of the last things that we do is we make sure that parents are involved. Uh, so we, we call all the parents that, that we interviewed and we, we talk to them about the importance of maintaining a positive school culture. We give them all the details of what we know and then we, we communicate some of the restorative practices that we've put into place. And we also make sure that we only give out information that is confidential for that individual student. So the, all of those things are important, but we want parents to feel like they are a partner in this process. Again, bullying is something that that we take very seriously as administrators. We take very seriously as as teachers and staff in the building, and and we want and want to continue to maintain Triad as being a very positive place. In conclusion, we want to acknowledge that there is a lot of information on the topic of bullying. But what is crucial for you to take away from this is that communication is key. Make sure an open dialogue continues. 
Understand that all incidents are taken seriously, and even though you or your child may not see or hear about the results of an investigation, we are working to resolve it so that your child can feel safe at school and be successful because we all want the same goal. We also understand that despite our efforts to resolve an issue, it may take more than one intervention in order to remediate the problem. So please keep communicating with us so we can work together. If you have additional questions or concerns, contact the building administration. Contact info can be found at tcusd2.org.